Um, uh, my name is Hai Bo Fein. Um, I'm a lecturer from Osambra University in the UK, and I'm very glad that um, to uh, you know to join uh, this section with everybody else. And first, I, uh, I think uh, hope everybody of you guys uh, listened to the opening session a half an hour ago, which was hosted by Teams. First of all, I really want to thank the organization uh, committees. Also, one, one I am one of them. Uh, we spend um, quite a lot of time to make this happen um, because everybody knows due to these uh, COVID things, we couldn't have this uh, a two-year meeting happening in Leiden. So we kind of have this alternative way, which is very nice. And we can see right now we have all, almost, we have 24 audience for this session only. And I'm sure we have three other, two other part of sections also will have uh, four audiences. Um, thank you again for Stephen and Anna, and uh, um, both of them are the coordinators. And you won't believe how many how many emails we've been receiving just to make this happen. And thank you then. Also, I want to thank you to the presenters. We have five presenters for this section: the topic is circular economy of uh, the built environment, and uh, some are from the, this, this time zone. Some others are from. Uh, European time zones, and I really appreciate it, as I know it's uh, midnight. Sometimes some people are like uh, even after 12 uh, midnight, and I appreciate your time. Also, I also want to say, uh, apologize because for this session, we have quite a lot of submissions. Some of submissions we couldn't accept them to do the presentation, so we have to send them to the poster section. So please make sure you join the poster sections after our session. There will be lots of good um, information there as well. And uh, also for the audiences, um, no matter you are in the uh, Asian Pacific zone or the other zones, thank you very much for your time to attend. And we have five presenters with excellent uh, information to, to show and I hope you can enjoy. The last one is about this session topic, uh, circular economy of the built environment. Uh, I think this is basically the match with the, 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 the theme of the uh, ISAE these years. Circular economy is getting really popular nowadays, and not only in, uh, in Europe or US, or globally. And myself, I'm doing uh, building environment. That's why, as the initial purpose to uh, bring up this session, I'm trying to bring the scholars uh, together globally and to share the information of what we are doing in terms of circular economy in the building environment, no matter in buildings or infrastructures or in economy, et cetera. And my personally, my research is related to life cycle assessment, building environment, also sustainable construction. And I'm also really happy for collaborations if anybody is interested. Okay, and now uh, this section, uh, I have to uh, pass to my partner, um, patient. Without her, uh, this session won't happen. Now patient, for uh, uh, Aria, I call him, I call her Aria as well. Now floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Pei Li. Uh, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Civil Engineering at Tongzhi University in Shanghai, China. So same as Dr. Fong, I got my PhD degree from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. So thank you, Dr. Fong, for inviting me to co-organize this meeting. Uh, my previous research focuses on how to make the uh, built environment more comfortable for built human beings and at the same time benign to the environment. Now at Tongji University, I'm focusing more on the carbon emissions of buildings and constructions uh, because the Chinese government, as you know, is committed to the world to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. So therefore, a circular economy is indeed a very important topic for us. Um, so I'm great. Uh, I'm very happy and it's a great pleasure and chance for me to learn from the intelligent brains all over the world. So hope everyone can enjoy this meeting. So before we start, let's let me give a final reminder to everyone. Uh, please unmute yourself, but you're welcome to open your video, open your camera. And if you have any question, please leave a message in the chat, or you can leave your question to the Q&A session to ask directly to the presenters. Um, and after the meeting, in the very end, we'll take a screenshot as a group picture. So hope everyone can stay to the end. Okay, so first, let's welcome 
Rafaela Torado from ETH Zurich to give us a speech. Welcome, Rafaela. Thank you so much. Um, I can share my screen, maybe. Yeah, you can go ahead sharing your screen. Okay, thank you. First of all, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rafaela Tirado, and I'm from Peru, and a PhD student from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Um, I'm in it because I'm, I've always had a very strong concern about our built environment and its complex interactions with the natural environment that have a massive impact on the world around us. It is uh, now that the built environment constitutes a dominant stock and a potential future source for different uh, secondary raw materials. Therefore, the tailored information about the material composition of buildings is necessary to determine, determine the resource potential of the building stock. So for today, uh, I will present you uh, the building material flow characterization model that I'm working in for multi-scalar circular economy studies. So the structure of the presentation, first, first of all, I have a little introduction about circular economy and urban metabolism. Uh, secondly, I will present you the materials and methods used for this uh, model. And um, finally, I will present you a study case uh, for yield difference ration and some conclusions. So, since 2007, more people have lived in cities than in rural areas. Cities consume most of the health resource and account for 60 to 80 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. According to the United Nations, by 2050, two thirds of the population will live in cities. A galloping urbanization movement. So this represents a challenge for cities to adapt to this growth, both in terms of consumption and in terms of waste management. And knowing more that the day of pacing is each time, time uh, earlier. As cities develop ever faster, how can they reduce the environmental impact and improve the quality of life of cities? Uh, the dwellers while respecting the limits of the planet. How do it? How can we do it? First, requiring used to do more with less. That is, cities must must provide services of whatever are resource efficient, uh, environmentally friendly, resilient, and equitable. Urban metabolism will help us understand what is happening with resource from their entry into the territory to their exit and waste generations. When we learn that territories function as organisms that consume resources and produce waste, we can find ways to improve the use of resources and reduce environmental impacts. Several territories currently have a linear metabolism. That is to say, most of the resources that we enter to territory will go out as waste. The key for a territory to become resilient is to capture this waste as a resource and reinsert it into the economic loop. Therefore, we will get a metabolism flowing. For example, the secondary materials obtained from the different stage of the circular economy can be reinserted into the loop, avoiding the overcrowding of resources and limiting the impacts. It is noted that the main material flows in the city are those of the construction sector Therefore, the challenge of quantifying the flow of the territorial resource or develop, develop operations is um, therefore possible. So now the question is how to identify and quantify the resource that make up these flows. 
uh, the question of the scale or perimeter for the quantification and analysis also arises. And finally, how can the sector be made circular? So it is the principal part of this presentation, how we can quantify the different uh, resource in the territory. Currently, there are a lot of methods that uh, allow us uh, the quantification of this resource, but the most part of uh, this models or methods are focused on the residential sector and we need to understand both residential and non-residential sector. Another gap is that the models use archetypes, for example, where we have a short description of buildings with not have all the description or characteristic of external and internal structures. Another gap is uh, that uncertainty and sensitivity analysis is not uh, done in this kind of uh, models. And we need to analyze these uncertainties because stakeholders need uh, um, information, uh, real information. So, what are the needs for develop this model? What needs uh, were identified? So first of all, promote secondary resource uh, because it's necessary to know in detail the natural quantity and location of the materials present in the building stock. Um, not only uh, the materials in the envelope or, or facades are needed, uh, we need uh, information about infrastructures and superstructures too. Uh, all the materials uh, will be studied, not only minerals or metals. We want to analyze uh, no mineral, uh, mineral metals, uh, good, uh, dangerous and non dangerous uh, materials. Uh, the method uh, will be applied to different sectors, residential and non-residential. We have uh, some sub-sectors in here too. Uh, different scales can be applied to with uh, or studied for, with uh, our method. About the methodology, uh, so. Our building stock uh, model methodology, methodology is structured in two main parts, the building stock material characterization and the building stock assessment through the material stock composition and the material waste generator generated by this, the construction. The building stock characterization follows three steps. Uh, the first one is territory building sample generation by crossing structural data from that from three uh, national databases where buildings with a generic description are obtained. Uh, then uh, macro components catalog uh, development with detailed information of nature and performance of materials uh, that compose the existing buildings. And the structure uh, by building elements, for example, walls, roofs, floor, etc. Uh, the third part uh, concerns the sub steps. So, these sub steps uh, allow us to have a material description of buildings in the sample. Uh, the building stock assessment concerns the calculus of nature and quantity material stock and flows for the territory. Uh, firstly, the calculus is realized realized for the sample and then extrapolated at the territory level. So um, the analyzed building stock is constituted of residential buildings and non-residential buildings. For our segmentation, we consider in the residential sector, the individual houses and the multifamily houses. In the non-residential buildings, we consider only the office industrial and scholar buildings. The model used only a sample of buildings to calculate material stocks and flows of all the buildings in that territory. 
the sample was obtained by crossing national databases that allow us uh, to obtain the title description of uh, these buildings. Then the buildings principal information like uh, use, age, and structure material is matched with a, catal a catalog of macro components uh, that allow us to describe the entire building. Uh, the nature and quantity of materials are calculated for every building in the sample by, by multiplying the macro component. Sorry to interrupt, but you have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. So when we have all this information at the end for the sample, we can extrapolate for the territory. So this, we have here the three databases. So we have the cadastral database, a French national land tax files too, and a energy performance diagnostic database with uh, information about materials, about the geometry of buildings. Then with the macro component uh, bottom up approach, we can have uh, all the description of for every building in the sample. So this description, description concerns every part of the building, uh, like in the figure here in the slide. Uh, we have a description, a detailed description by materials and products for every macro component. And when we obtain all the information for every building, we can have uh, extra, we can, we are extrapolating the information because we are working first with a sample and we need information at the territory level. In our case for in the front region, uh, the principal question was, uh, what is the material composition of the different buildings contained in the, in the region? What distribution by area and age of buildings and what materials are predominant in the region? So for this, we uh, analyze every department and then we are aggregating all the information at the region level. So the, the degree of urbanization of every department is different, especially for Paris where the urbanization is very low uh, already of uh, uh, 90%. So here we have uh, the sample construction. It's uh, in the entry, we have uh, 1 million of buildings. And for the sample, we have only uh, 100,000 uh, buildings. So it, is, it represents only 5% of uh, the population. For the results, uh, we can have results by different, for every segment in the population or in the sample, like uh, the construction period or the use of building or the macro component composition. For example, here we have a um, key with a, with a result so by macro component uh, distribution. And we can have that the most of buildings, so the most part of resource uh, represent the concrete, are represented by concrete or, or stone, bricks, or another types of materials. And these materials are coming for intermediate floors, exterior walls, and low floors so in the most part of time. And we have here uh, the low floors that uh, are uh, very representative because uh, uh, in Ile de France region, we have a lot of individual housings. It is for the stock and for demolition, we have uh, uh, the same concrete and stone, and stone uh, in, the first, uh, in the first part of representation. And it is coming uh, mostly uh, by the period of construction too. So uh, before, uh, before the war, and it is coming mostly from residential sector. Some conclusions for this model, 
Uh, in fact, our my contributions are several. First of all, because we are doing a macro component approach, so, so we have a very detailed description of buildings in the territory. And this bottom up description allow us to have uh, different scales of description uh, for the stock and for the flows of resource. Uh, we are studying not only residential sector, we are studying the non-residential sector too. Um, for this model, we are doing a quantitative analysis of uncertainties will uh, allow us to analyze the reliability of the model results. Thank you for your attention. If you have uh, some questions, I'm here to answer you. Uh, thank you, Rafaela, but we are leaving all the questions to the so thank you for your presentation. Um, next, we will have Ning Zhang from um, Lebanese Institute of Ecological, Urban and Regional Development. Um, please make your speech within 15 minutes because we have many speakers and people may want to go to next session after this. So thank you. Welcome, Ning. Okay. Okay, we'll stop to sharing your screen and then. Uh, Rafaela, please stop sharing your screen. Okay, so it's done. Okay, thank you. And uh, hello everyone, and uh, due to the absence of the Dr. Schiller, I'm here to represent him to present this research. I'm a first year PhD student in the research group of Dr. Schiller, and it's my honor to be here and uh, share this research with you. The research is titled Modeling Circularity Using Continuous Material Flare Analysis. And uh, this research is supported by the Leibniz Institute of Ecological Urban and Regional Development. Um, our research institute is located in Dresden, Germany, and the, the whole institute is working on urban and the regional sustainable development and the transformation across multiple spatial scales. In terms of our research group, Mm, we carry out the research on anthropogenic and the natural resources efficiency and the climate protection in the built environment. So the, the circularity of construction materials is one of our important research focuses. Mm, the basis of the circularity model in the material is the material catastrophes for the quantity of buildings, we combined the municipal statistics and the GIS data together to obtain the two and the three dimensional building information. Then is the specific material content for different building types. We considered the single family homes and the multi-family homes for diverse age classes in terms of residential buildings and the different types of non-residential buildings, um, something like agricultural buildings, industrial buildings, and the commercial buildings. The results of very detailed stock and the flows of construction materials can be obtained by combining these two types of cadastral and data together. Um, I just mentioned that we divide the buildings into different categories. This information can be, can be found in the data back of our institute. The building types in Germany at a macro level include the residential buildings, non-residential buildings, and the infrastructure. And the level of detail, the various structures of buildings are clearly divided, such as the, the foundation, the roof, the ceiling, and the wall. As a lot of linear material flare analysis studies provided, 
they look at the inflows, outflows, and the stock of construction materials. But I think all these approaches have um, in common that they do not allow any connection, connections between output and input within the methodology. So here we take up this with the approach presented and uh, develop an approach to bring outflows and inflows together into the loops, um, which we call continuous material flow analysis. The continuous MFA can close the flow of materials by considering the recycling of construction and the demolition waste and the utilization of the recycled products. Mm, the conventional ma material flow analysis generally includes the extraction of the materials from natural and the recycled resources, the stock of the materials in the built environment, and the generation of the construction and the demolition waste. Mm, at the end of life stage of the construction materials, a certain proportion of them mm, will be recycled. Here we take non-metallic mineral building materials as an example by combining with the recycling process, a certain material flow can be formed. By going deep into the, the productive process of the recycled materials, here we use concrete and the recycled. We found that the recycling process was uh, accompanied by some outflows like capture loss and the new inflows like additional of new materials like cement, um, water, and uh, some new aggregates. The semicycle on the left showed that only 43% of the concrete debris can be made into usable recycled aggregates. Uh, as a result, 36 of the concrete debris could be used to make the same volume of new concrete. Then we applied the material composition indicators along the process chains. Different terms are used to describe the building materials in different stages of the, of the material, material flow. The line in this figure refers to the flow of materials. You can see from the from the left that the two types of the raw materials are in are the inflows of the building materials, raw materials and the secondary raw materials. They can be calculated by using the recipes and the standards of the construction materials. Then at the end of life stage. Mm, building materials flow out in the form of the construction and the demolition waste and uh, enter the recycling process to be to be produced into secondary raw materials. So by combining the mm, furthermore by combining the life cycle assessment approach with localized life cycle assessment emission factors inventory, the environment impact of the entire cycle can be calculated. Um, in particular, the climate change caused by the gray CO2 emissions. The, the cycle of building materials can also provide some information for planning decisions. Since there are many stakeholders involved in the waste management and the recycling industry, the results of the continuous material analysis can be used for decision making for war for all related parties. For example, the government is the main manager of environment impact and the calculation of CO2 emissions in the process is beneficial to the to the climate protection policy formulation of the government or the local authorities. Mm, then the supply of the recycled and the secondary materials can provide some information for architects, civil, engineer, civil, civil engineers, or some urban planners. 
Then I'd like to introduce an application example for our circuit concepts. This example is come from Hamburg. Hamburg is a large port city in Northern Germany, and we developed the material cadastres for this city. Then we use our approach to calculate the, the generation of the West in the next 10 years, the 2020 to 2030. And as I mentioned before, the West can be the inflows of the recycling process. In this specific city, Hamburg, the local authority first gave us the, the primary urban building information and the way estimated how much anthropogenic resources will be provided in this city and how much recycled materials will be used in new buildings. Two types of buildings that local authorities can directly influence were included in our consideration. The social housing and the multifamily houses and the for residential use and the public non-residential buildings. And to the end, the calculation results show that the, the potential supply of the recycled aggregates can be completely consumed. The all anthropogenic materials come from the city can be used again in this city. The circularity and the closed loop utilization of the construction materials not only solve the problem of material shortage and the waste generation, but also helps mitigate the, the global oil potential. Here we also take hamburger as an example in the next 30 years from 2020 to 2050. They, there will be a relatively obvious effect on emission mitigation if the recycling and the low carbon strategies were adopted for residential buildings in the city. Specifically, um, technical innovation could provide an estimated 19% reduction in emissions. Then tech, um, the technical innovation here include included the, the material replacement on the building element level in new residential buildings, such as using wooden materials to substitute mineral materials. Go further step, the adoption of the social innovation in existing buildings could contribute an additional emission reduction of the 11%. Another strategy is called sufficiency. Mm, to reduce the, the per capita living area in the new building span and uh, provide it can provide uh, mm, smaller flats and uh, houses in Hamburg. This plan may help further reduce the green emissions by 19%. The above is the description of the continuous material for analysis in a general perspective. This research is led by Dr. Schiller, and as I said before, I'm a first year PhD student, and I will use this research as a starting point for my PhD study. My next plan is to carry out a general research and the Chinese case study by combining the, the special characteristics and the circular built environments. And the, that's all the content of this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ning, for the wonderful speech. It's pretty on time. Thank you. Um, and now we have a five minute Q&A session to take questions from the audience. Anyone has questions for the two speakers? You can just unmute yourself and speak directly. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I think first for um, Rafaela. Uh, I don't know if you are there. Um, for your research, I just want to have a general question: like, uh, how how is your findings contribute to the circular economy? Maybe Ling, Ling you can stop sharing, so we can okay. see like, the face. 
Yes, I'm here. In fact, when we have a macro component description, we have a detailed description of every building in the territory. So uh, when are we talking about circular economy, we need to understand and know that building characteristics. So if you know the more specific detailed characteristics of the buildings, then you can, or the stakeholders can formulate strategies at different scales from the building to the territory, it can be a city or a nation. So it's the principal contribution of my work. Nice, thank, thank you very you. much. And uh, a quick question for, for Ning as well, is uh, I think uh, you, you provide lots of uh, specific numbers for recycling percentage. Um, I don't know, like if in Germany, if there's any like rules defined, like for how many percentage of, of recycling required to be called a circular economy? Okay. I can start to show you my screen. Okay, there is a standard in Germany the forty five percent of the recycled aggregates can be the maximum the maximum data can be used in the in the recycled concrete. and the recycling rate in Germany is more than eighty percent in concrete debris. So I think that's the specific data for you. Okay, and um for how how about for the other materials? Have you had I'm not sure the data in German because I'm just here for, for half, half a year. Okay, good, good. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Peter Barrett here. I, I had a quick question for, for Ning. Um, I thank you for the talks, both by Rafaela and Ning. And my question for Ning is, um, how do you describe the difference between dynamic material flow analysis and continuous uh, MFA? Okay, in our, in our research, we develop um, a closed loop on material flow, not uh, on the materials flows. We connect the outflow of the construction and demolition waste um, with, the, with the inflows of the recycled materials. And this is the, the, the biggest difference between the conventional MFA and the continuous MFA. MFA. Okay, I okay. hope that. Okay. Yeah, right. thank you. So I see there is a question in the chat. Is the concrete recycled or downcycled in road beds, etc.? Um, Maud Lanol, could you maybe ask directly to the speaker? Are you asking Ning or Ravala? I think you're asking Ning, right? Okay, I think this problem is for me. Yeah. And in this in and in this study, we calculated the recycled recycled concrete aggregates and the the, the reuse of the recycled aggregates. We we consider different. Uh, different uh, scenarios like the road and the residential buildings and the, the, the houses and the flat. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ning. Um, because our time is pretty limited, I, I guess there are more questions from the audience. So maybe you can message the speaker directly. Um, so you may have any like maybe collaborations after this session. Uh, so next, let's um, welcome Dr. Leonardo Rosado from Chalmers University of Technology. Welcome, Dr. Rosado. Yes. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, oh, this is too, too dark. I will stop my video. Uh, Thank you so much for, for uh, uh, letting me present today. Uh, it's a good honor to, to be here, even if I'm sitting at home. <laughs> but, uh, but given the circumstances, I think that's, that's the best we can have right now. Um, 
I would like to share my screen, but it, oh yeah, good. Um, I will be presenting um, my uh, talk uh, on um, mapping interests and barriers for use uh, of materials um, in the built environment. And this is um, also um, a lot about um, doing the first exploration on the potential for a digital twin approach uh, to this. Uh, I will I will cover a couple of a lot of grounds here, so I'll try to be quick as, as much as I can. So the idea is really to to look into how can a digital twin city be used to to promote circular economy, and we're looking into the built environment, and more specific. Uh, and uh, we're also trying to see what are the opportunities and the challenges behind it. Uh, so on one side, uh, we could have. Uh, digital twin cities as opportunities to scale up the knowledge about stocks of materials in buildings and infrastructure. Uh, we've heard Rafael and Ning talking a lot about this already. I also have been working uh, in the past with building stock models, uh, looking into materials and uh, material flows, etc. So I also understand a bit about uh, how, how that is, but I think we also need to, to see how can we step it up a little bit more. Um, at the same time, digital twin cities or digital twin models can provide a good platform for collaboration. And in this specific case, a good a platform also for analysis of what can be reused and what can be recycled, what types of materials uh, could be, or even components. Uh, however, there's still a lack of a structure inventory of materials in the building stock. There's a lot of different models as already been mentioned as well, uh, but there is not yet uh, I would say uh, some kind of structured approach that can be used uh, so far, not and especially not with digital twins. Uh, and there's also um, lack of knowledge about the type of information that is needed to ensure that um, all this information we have is really usable by society. And that's what we try to, to do here uh, in the first part of, of the job, of the work. Um, is really to try to understand what are the needs and the requirements to implement circular economy um, in the built environment. Uh, we want to look into uh, the material reuse coming from demolition uh, and also focus on this material reuse in the design and construction phases. Uh, and the approach that we've done so far was uh, to have a set of interviews with stakeholders in Sweden uh, and a literature review about um, challenges uh, in, in, in this field. Uh, again, the outcome here is to try to really evaluate how digital twin city uh, can be used to, to promote uh, resource efficiency. So having said that, the first thing that we set out to, to understand was, okay, what is the interest for reuse? Are uh, stakeholders interested in reusing materials from buildings in the stock? Um, we, we, we ask this uh, to a lot of different stakeholders. Uh, you can see the figures there. Um, the interest is generally positive across all stakeholders, including private owners. So uh, ourselves that we have our own houses and uh, want to refurbish them, for example. Uh, there is uh, an increase in the demand for used construction materials and products. Uh, and the main reasons for this are uh, reduce waste production and become uh, more circular. Uh, if we look into also um, the attitude towards using used materials, we can also see that in Sweden, stakeholders um, say that there is a, a change in, in the attitude. So more, more stakeholders want to, to reuse construction materials. Um, however, interestingly enough, uh, when talking about with the local government in Gothenburg, so the municipality of Gothenburg uh, in Sweden, uh, there's still some skepticism about uh, if this attitude is really um, penetrating uh, this, this, um, this field uh, with 50% 50, 50 saying that it has changed and others uh, saying that uh, didn't change. Um, however, when it comes to uh, wanting to use reuse materials, uh, almost all the stakeholders uh, say that they want to. 
Um, a little bit of exception here is the construction companies where there is some of them that are not willing to uh, reuse materials. So having uh, this uh, in mind, then we also try to understand a bit more in detail what, what exactly would they want to reuse. Uh, so we asked what types of materials or products uh, they would be more interested in, in reusing. So um, generally speaking, uh, products and materials that still perform their functions correctly are uh, interesting uh, products uh, to, to reuse. Uh, doors and windows were named uh, in, in, in a lot of the answers that were given. Um, and uh, these are some of the main uh, overview. Um, knowing this interest, knowing what types of products and what we wanted to do, look into in more detail were, okay, so what are the challenges that are posed um, in in uh, in this field uh, for for using uh, to do that we we uh, did a literature review and uh, we we assigned uh, for uh, six, six types of categories of challenges so technical knowledge market laws infrastructure and culture and norms I'm not going to describe them too much here you can ask me later if you want uh, I'm going to go through. Uh, the results we obtained from the literature review and also from the surveys we, we made to the stakeholders. So first of all, uh, when we look into the technical challenges, uh, we have identified two types or two subtypes if you want, technical challenges related to materials and components and to the design. Um, if you look into the challenges that were mostly uh, mentioned was that uh, um, the deconstruction of the buildings um, are um, concerning demolition companies and indirectly real estate owners. There is a difficulty in disassembling materials. Materials are glued to each other. Heavy structures cannot, cannot be moved from place, so they have to be dismantled on site, for example. It might have presence of hazardous materials or substances. Um, some of these materials and products might be deteriorated. Uh, some materials also and components have fixed dimensions that cannot be reused directly, steel beams, for example. And there's also a, a lack of special equipment and machinery for the construction. When we look into the knowledge challenges, there's a few of them. Um, some are related to routines, business models, decision-making processes, uncertainty, the environment, and so on. Again, just highlighting a few of them that were uh, identified. So there are no, or there are very few case studies on how to work with reuse. Uh, there are a lack of methods and an awareness about what can be reused. There's also a lot of uncertainties about what types and amounts of products are available uh, to, to reuse. Uh, and there is also lack of knowledge about the value of these products and their characteristics. Um, one, one example is uh, LCA uh, of reuse products. Um, if we move on to the market challenges, uh, again, we have uh, defined, identified three types. So time, costs, and competitiveness. Um, uh, if we look into them again, increased time uh, to ensure reuse is one of the most frequently mentioned challenges. So if we want to reuse things, there is more time spent uh, across. Uh, there, are, there are new ways of working in the construction. Uh, and design phase, for example, they require more time. Uh, it might be more labor intensive. Um, it also adds more processes, which will cost more. Um, and uh, due to the high cost of the construction and other services, new materials are often shipped cheaper, cheaper than uh, used materials. So these again are some of the challenges. If we move on also to the laws challenges, we can talk about warranties regulations, um, obsolete uh, materials related to the fact that uh, laws have been updated and other requirements. Um, one one of, of such examples is that for, for these materials to comply with building codes and standards, there is actually a lack of regulations for reused components. Um, also laws for health and safety have increased throughout time. Um, they are also required for the construction and all buildings and materials can be obsolete and not fulfill this legislation because they were uh, produced and, and built um, 
50 years ago or even more before that. Uh, regarding also infrastructure challenges, we have infrastructure challenges related to information and to lo logistics. So um, information that is needed in the design phase of new buildings using reused products is not always available. Um, uncertainty about the availability of the materials um, reduces the possibility of finding the right components at the right time. Uh, there's also a need to have trust between contractors and subcontractors. Um, we also need to deal with uh, questions about storage of materials uh, before they are going to be reused again. Uh, and there are also some uh, other challenges connected to the transportation of these materials and uh, ge geographic isolation. Uh, finally, uh, on the challenges uh, front, uh, we looked into the cultural norms challenges as well. Um, again, in several different subtypes, uh, there's, for example, perception that customers prefer new over reused products and that could pose a problem. Uh, expectation of tenants is also a challenge for reuse of old products as they can be perceived as unsafe uh, or uh, that they don't have enough quality um, and so on. Um, there is also the impression that demolition is more profitable than deconstruction uh, of buildings. And of course, uh, industry skepticism and tradition uh, and uh, inertia make it difficult to, to transition to a new paradigm. So all of these are challenges that are really need, we need to consider uh, and uh, we need to really take a step forward. So what we did next, we would started trying to do a pre preliminary inventory needs for specific type of products. We used it for doors and we looked into a couple of buildings. Um, and try to, to identify what type of information would we need uh, to describe uh, doors in a building that could possibly be reused later on. Uh, so uh, first of all, um, we, we identified three types of information that uh, need to be identified to ensure the description of used doors to be reused. So first of all, describing the product and accessing auxiliary documentation, then evaluating the existing conditions and the reuse potential of this product and also evaluation of barriers and challenges for reuse. So all of this information, at least in this preliminary phase needs to be compiled and needs to be uh, co uh, collected in order to uh, provide information that is useful uh, for uh, stakeholders to, to, to engage with this process. And of course, uh, one of the uh, next steps we are uh, going to make is to really try to understand how uh, which information uh, is also needed connected to other challenges that uh, we're still investigating and how then this can be translated into this digital twin city model and to what extent uh, can we provide uh, interesting information for the stakeholders then to act upon this process and uh, use um, re or reuse materials in, in, a, in a more efficient way. So we are going to continue to analyze the challenges uh, faced. Uh, then uh, we're including also the recycling in the analysis. And then once we have all of this work done, then we'll start identifying exactly what can be addressed by digital twin. Um, and from there, uh, also look into uh, state-of-the-art tools for inventory of characteristics of materials of products. And again, uh, some of the presentations here today already uh, shown us uh, good examples of what could be connected to a digital twin to be able to provide information uh, for uh, this process. However, there's still a lot of other information that needs to be collected as mentioned, such as uh, what types of characteristics the materials have, which regulations they fulfilled, what types of regulations were in place when these materials and products were, were uh, built uh, and so on. Uh, so this, I would say there's still a lot of work to be done, uh, but uh, we're starting to try to really understand what can be done uh, with this digital twin approach. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you wanna uh, ask me something, please send me a message or uh, we can talk uh, later on or even by email if you want. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Rosado. Um, I do have a question, but I'll leave it to the end to the Q&A session. So thank you. Uh, next, we have two speakers from University of Sheffield, Will Minkelson and Charles Gillett. Welcome. Fantastic. Will, are you uh, ready to share the screen then? Yeah, I'm just having a bit of trouble sharing it. It says I can't, so it's disabled for participants. Um, I don't know if I need to join in a different way or get promoted or something. You're co-host here, so you can share your screen. Ah, oh, there we go. Great, is that, is that up now? Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, I'll get things started then. Um, first of all, just thank you to everyone for coming here today, um, whether it's the morning or the afternoon, and to the people uh, involved with organising this and um, putting this on for us today. Um, I'll be speaking, obviously, with Will today um, on a project that we've recently completed at the University of Sheffield, uh, and this is Regenerate, which is a circular economy engagement and assessment tool um, for both new and existing buildings. So this project focused on integrating uh, circular economic design strategies within the construction sector, and it's been completed as part of an EPSRC uh, accelerator fund um, here at the University of Sheffield. So this saw myself uh, work alongside Will, who's obviously presenting with us today, uh, and under the supervision of uh, Daniel Densley Tingley. And into the project team, we also uh, brought in Dave Cheshire, who was a director at ACOM, a uh, construction company here in the UK. Um, and really that was just to ensure that everything um, that we were proposing within the tool was consistent with what was required within the construction sector. So we've been very careful within the entire project to make sure that we are um, disseminating information from academia um, towards the industrial setting. Really, this was one of the main motivations of the project, um, it was because typically, although uh, the importance of embedding a circular economy within the built environment is known fairly well within academia, um, the understanding of this uh, and also willingness to push for this within the industry um, isn't quite matched. So this represents a situation whereby uh, if, even if people within the sector did want to um, ensure that their designs were more circular, they, uh, they didn't really know how. To combat this, um, we identified four different challenges at the outset of the project, um, and these were things that we wanted the provision of the tool uh, to try and overcome. One of the issues was that um, people currently had a limited awareness of circular philosophies, and also the contribution design actions that make them um, contribute to this. So like I said, if they wanted to make their designs more circular or contribute towards the uh, circular economy, um, they didn't actually know how at present. We also noted a lot of um, not my problem thinking within the sector, and this meant that um, basically different stakeholders um, often thought that consideration of the circular economy was the responsibility of someone else. So maybe the client thinking that the contractor will look after this or vice versa. We also noted that although there was a range of different tools uh, available for assessing the circularity of building designs, and these were often quite difficult to use and time consuming, basically because they required a lot of different data. Uh, and this meant that we wanted to make a data light version um, a tool that could readily access, uh, assess designs, uh, initial design stages. We also heard uh, multiple claims of false high circularity in the industry. So maybe people saying that their building was highly circular if it just reused a small amount of um, recycled material. And this meant that it was something that we wanted to stamp out of the industry um, by developing the Regenerate tool. So from these challenges, we then developed uh, four aims. The first of these was to collate evidence on circular design practice. This is both academic and industrial evidence, but also then to promote this within the industrial setting. To stop people having this not my problem thinking, um, we wanted the tool to engage multiple stakeholders across different project stages. This meant that each individual stakeholder knew what responsibilities they had in terms of uh, ensuring uh, the circular economy and at different design stages. To allow people to analyze different designs, uh, maybe concept designs at uh, an early stage, we wanted to provide a data-like means of assessing building circularity. This also generated outputs that could be compared at a glance, so we could very quickly see uh, in design meetings which design options were more or less circular than others. To stop people um, making false claims of, that their building was highly circular, we also wanted to generate to offer a platform uh, on which these claims were required to be both justified and evidenced. So if someone was saying that their uh, development or that their building was highly circular, 
they had to evidence this um, and someone could request this from them. These aims are reflected both in the title of this presentation and in the ethos of Regenerate, with the first two aims pretty much um, being to engage stakeholders and the last two aims um, being related to the assessment of existing buildings. So there is this duality uh, in the aims of Regenerate and hopefully in the tool that we've developed. And I should pass over to Will, who will give you a brief overview about the tool and how it works and, and why it is set up the way that it is. Thanks, Charles. Uh, yeah, so as Charles said, um, we identified the need for a tool that engages stakeholders and also indicates building circularity, whilst also raising awareness of the circular economy within industry. Um, to develop the tool, we followed an iterative building test process, beginning with a review of existing guides, literature and uh, reports, as well as consulting with previous industry professionals at the university. Uh, the aim of that was to understand the range of uh, different projects seen across the industry so that we could then identify the functionality that we were required to capture um, a wide range of different projects. Uh, this then led into our um, external review, which involved a stakeholder workshop with practicing engineers, consultants, contractors and architects. Um, we reviewed and refined the criteria and made the functionality more suitable to a, uh, an industry setting. Um, this review also involved um, identifying areas that industry professionals aren't so aware of so that we could encourage engagement with the circular economy and free up any of those sticking points that we see within projects. Uh, we then made the final amendments and then to release this spreadsheet, uh, spreadsheet version of the tool alongside the new London plan. Um, the London plan is a, a policy which requires all referable projects in the Greater London area uh, to submit circular economy statements to get planning permission. Um, and we've incorporated the requirements for this in the key reporting forms that are required to complete the circular economy statements within, within the tool. Uh, and then from there, we just developed the final freely available online web version of Regenerate, um, which I'll show you some screenshots of uh, in some later slides. Uh, we incorporated some of the feedback that we've received from various users, and we also improved some of the functionality um, and the accessibility of information from the previous spreadsheet version. Uh, so before I get on to the final solution, I just want to highlight this diagram, which outlines a design workflow for efficiently integrating uh, principles into the design process. And this just looks at the order in which circular economic principles should be integrated to maximise um, building circularity. Uh, various work that Danielle's students have actually uh, undertaken suggests that you can incorporate design for adaptability um, for, for, for change of use into initial designs for no carbon penalty compared to current practice when you combine this with other material efficiency strategies such as design for deconstruction uh, circular material selection and resource efficiency. And actually, if you incorporate these so that you can uh, extend the building lifespan uh, significantly, then you do get significant uh, carbon savings. So the result of the, the first two review stages that I just went through um, was the aggregation of all this criteria into these principles, uh, which we identified through the literature and then we ref refined that through stakeholder meetings. So the, the solution that we arrived at is a circular economy engagement and assessment tool. Uh, as we don't have time to actually run through the tool, I'll just split the next few slides up into the assessment and the engagement side of it, but both are integrated between our website and the tool itself. Um, so essentially the way the assessment works is the user will break down the project into zones, into different building zones and they'll indicate the gross floor area of the zone, the development type, the structural form, the building use, and whether any of the layers um, are reused in their entirety. So the layers we're looking at are site, um, structure, skin, services, and space. Uh, the user will then respond yes, no, or to be determined to each of the criteria within each principle. Um, and the tool will weight the, cri uh, the credit sorry, for each zone by its contribution to the total floor area of the project. So if there's two zones and they both have the same gross floor area, they'll achieve the same credit, summing up to one, so they'll both achieve um, 0.5. Um, and then it'll also automatically award credits for the layers that the users indicated are entirely reused. 
Um, so yeah, we've got 86 circularity criteria, which are split across the four principles that we saw in the design workflow. And those criteria are aggregated by the building layer. We've added in um, supporting statements for all the criteria so that users are able to justify their de design decisions and then also make notes to revisit um, from meetings at a later date. Uh, so I'll just quickly run through some of the screenshots of the, the tool just to give you a flavour for how it looks. Uh, so as you can see, we've got the four key circularity principles. Um, and for each of these, you can outline a circularity principle aim. So whether you um, intend to achieve full basic or, or um, partial circularity. And this was an output from our stakeholder workshops. But what this tool is going to do is it's going to take anonymized data from users combined with the build materials um, section, which is at the end of the tool. Um, and we'll be able to uh, get a better understanding for what current sort of standard practices um, and what sort of criteria most projects meet. Um, and from there, we can feed that into our wider framework of um, circular economy and material stocks research at the University of Sheffield. And um, we can better, get a better understanding of the circular economic potential of um, different buildings in different areas. Um, so this is an example of one of the credits. Um, as you can see, there's two zones. Uh, there's two zones that both have the same building use structural form, but because one is a new build and one is a refurbishment uh, development type, they're two separate zones. Uh, and as you can see, you just drop down the box and you self-certify yes, no, or to be determined. Uh, if you want further information on this, you can click the additional information button and you'll get some uh, guidance and uh, a link to our resources section on our website where you can download the guides and the literature that we've used. Um, this is one of the, uh, an example of the circular, circularity outputs. And this is just looking at the relative performance of building layers um, between each of the circularity principles so you can easily compare which principles are performing best and which layers are performing best. And then there's a more detailed um, tabulated version of this looking at the percentage of the selected um, circularity aim that you've achieved and what the awarded circularity rating is for each of the layers within each of the principles. Uh, so for the engagement side, we're aware that the level of detail evolves as the projects evolve and um, also that these principles need to be integrated from the outset of a project. So we've included various decision-making tools and resources with that in mind. And um, we've included an assessment scope and a strategic approach section. Um, and I'll show you those on the following slides. We also have the website, um, which has support in uh, resources and guidance uh, and some of examples of best practice and some explanation on the, the circular economy to try and raise awareness and um, foster a better understanding of the circular economy within industry. Uh, we've also created user accounts, uh, design teams and projects, so you can easily transfer the projects between design teams. You don't have to save and send out spreadsheets every time. Uh, which just integrates it all into the project much better. So this is the first, first page of the tool, it's the assessment scope. This is just outlining the objectives and the user responses required at that project stage, uh, which is really important for effectively incorporating these principles and criteria from the outset of the project and then continuing to incorporate them and support these criteria throughout the project. And then we have the strategic approaches section, which is looking at maximising the residual value of existing material and the future value of new material. And this is a modified version of the decision tree, which is in the new London plan. Uh, and you simply just follow the, the questions through. The, the questions that are no longer relevant will be greyed out. And then you get an advised approach in the top corner. So it'll tell you whether you should be reusing or repurpose, repurposing the structure. Um, and if we look at the future value of new materials, it's looking at the, the permanency of the structure. So whether if it's, if it's temporary, is there a market for um, elements following its deconstruction? If it's permanent, how long, how long do you expect the building to be used for? And from that, you get an advised approach on what you should be focusing on in your, in your project. So that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the main features of Regenerate. I hope that's made sense, but I'll pass back over to Charles now to finish up. Cheers, Will. So, yeah, since we uh, released Generate, uh, Regenerate around uh, a year and a bit ago, it's been very well see received within uh, industry and also within academia as well. 
Um, it's now got more than 500 users of the tool. Um, and because of this, we've also been involved in delivering some um, continual professional development sessions uh, for different engineering consultancy and, and contracting companies. From this, we've also had interest from um, the Irish Green Building Council, who are now looking at actually implementing the use of Regenerate within their circular workflows. Uh, so really pleased with that. As well as being involved uh, in the development of the tool and the testing of the tool, uh, the University of Sheffield Estates team, and um, so the, the, the team that manage all the different buildings at the university, uh, have actually now made a pledge to um, integrate the use of Regenerate on all um, redevelopment or new build projects over two million pounds. So really, we can really you know, start to see Regenerate being uh, implemented within industry and hopefully making um, these promotions of these more circular design decisions. As part of this uptake, we've also had uh, a number of case studies sent back to us from uh, people who've used Regenerate on actual live building projects. Um, and the, an example of one is what you can see on the screen now. Um, so across all the four um, circularity principles, we can see that through um, design iteration one to design iteration two, by using Regenerate, um, although the building has become um, no more deconstructible, it has actually become more adaptable um, and more resource efficient and employing more circular materials. So you can see how Regenerate, by getting people to think about um, the design decisions they're making within their building, is helping to transition the built environment towards uh, the circular economy that we all know it needs. So yeah, just bring it back to the aims and what we wanted to set out with and um, when we developed Regenerate and we feel um, that having had the feedback we have from industry, um, you know, we have met the aims of both engaging stakeholders and um, but also providing the means uh, of assessing the circularity of buildings so that these can be compared um, between different design options. Uh, so yeah, that, that's all from us and um, we'll be happy to take your questions uh, at the end um, when we get to the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles and Noel, for sharing this interesting tool. I'll do check it out later. Um, and last but not least, let's welcome Zhu Yu Chen from Tongji University. Zhu Yu, you can share your screen now. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I find I can't share my screen. Uh. Okay. It's changed, I think you're okay now. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Zhu, and I am a PhD student in Tongji University, China. My supervisor is Chen Shouming, a professor. It's my honor to have the opportunity to share our paper, The Effects of a Circular Economy on economic growth across natural experiment in China. My presentation is divided into the following five parts. Firstly, research background. Our research was conducted in China, where GDP growth, uh, where GDP has been growing at an average annual rate of nearly 10% for 30 years and has increased about 70 times. Meanwhile, the consumption of heavy chemical, pro chemical products as well as pollution has increased uh, by almost uh, uh, 15 times in order to decouple economic development from both consumption and pollution. China started to promote the CE pilot city nationwide. According to the two documents, there are 10 CE pilot provinces and cities in the first batch, and uh, 17 C pilot provinces and cities in the second batch. So what is CE? It's a sustainable, develop, uh, it's a sustainable development strategy with three R uh, principles of reducing, reusing, and recycling materials. Since the CE policy was enacted, uh, every pilot city has designed plans to develop CE, which has promoted technical progress, energy conservation, emission reduction, as well as the development of new industry. Then the second part, research purpose and the hypothesis. Uh, our research aim is to explore the impact of CE policy on the local economic growth rate 
Although previous study has developed various trials, such as following accounting, but these indicators about uh, the evolution evaluation of uh, the direct consequences of CE, which cannot evaluate uh, the economic impact of CE pilot program. Even though some existing indicators are relevant to local economic development, there are endogenous problems caused by unobserved factors or selection bias. So in order to mitigate the endogeneity, we applied the PSM DID method. Uh, in this paper, we hypothesis, uh, so we can skip this. Uh, uh, in this paper, we propose two hypotheses. Uh, since the promotion of C requires a large amount of investment by brains return slowly, the process of transforming traditional development model will put a financial burden on the local government in the early age. Uh, in the in the early stage, therefore, the first hypothesis is the GDP growth rate of the CE pilot city is is suppressed in the short term. But as time goes by, the development model gradually shows its advantages because the local government has found and adapted to the path of high quality development which improves resource use efficiency and the level of material you use. Besides, CE policy also improve economic efficiency. Therefore, the second hypothesis is that as time goes on, the CE pilot cities policy don't have a lasting negative effect on the GDP growth rate. Then we use PS MDID method to examine these two hypotheses. So why do we use PSM, uh, PSM DID? As mentioned before, it can be used to mitigate the noise brought by unobserved factors and the selection bias. PSM is used to match the samples of ex experiment group with control group, uh, which possess the most similar characteristics BID is used to estimate whether there is difference in GDP growth between the experimental group and the country group. This is our PSM DID model. And our data is from uh, CISMAR, China Stock Market and Accounting Research Database. The time window is from uh, 2001 and to 2012. Samples before PSM include uh, 3,166 observations of 283 cities. The dependent variable is GDP growth rate and the independent variable is pilot city, which is a dummy variable, which equals to one if if the city is a pilot city, is a pilot city in T year, and the control variables, uh, and there are seven control variables and uh, five matching variables. Then we can see the result of PSM. Uh, since there are two batches of CE pilots pilot cities, we need to conduct a PSM twice. For the first batch uh, of pilot cities in 2005, 40 pairs of pilot city and non-pilot city was uh, successfully matched. In, 2000 and, uh, in 2007, 53 pairs are successfully matched. The final matched uh, samples included 1,847 observations of 163 cities. The result of balancing test indicates a good quality of much data. 
The result of DID shows that the coefficient of pilot city is significantly negative, which indicates that becoming a pilot city of CE will slow down the local economic growth. Therefore, our hypothesis one is supported. Through evaluating the dynamic effect of CE policy, uh, we can see the effect of pilot city on local economic growth change with time. Also, we can, as uh, also as shown in the figure, uh, local GDP growth rate drops significantly when the pilot city program is launched, and thereafter, the pilot city program doesn't seem to have a significant impact on the following in the following year. So hypothesis two is also supported. In addition, we also conduct two heterogeneity analyses. Through the uh, comparison between China's three economic zones, we can know that CE policies has a significant ne negative effect on the economic growth in the Eastern and uh, Central and, and the central, uh, central regions, while it has a positive effect on the, economic, uh, uh, on the economic growth in the Western region. As for China's three industries, there is no effect, uh, there is no significant effect of say policy on the economic growth of primary industry, while GDP growth rate of sedentary industry and tertiary industry have a significant decline. So finally, we can conclude that the GDP growth rate of CE pilot cities is relatively slow due to the restraint by the CE policy. But in a long run, the negative effects of CE policy on the local economic growth will gradually weaken. In addition, the effect of CE policies of economic growth varies from pilot cities in different economic bears and a different main industry. So what implications can governments get? Firstly, government may need to bear the pain in the early stage after enduring the pain CE will reveal its advantages. Meanwhile, the, cent the central government should give financial support to cities that have just begun to implant CE policies. For cities in different economic beds, the formulation of CE policy should be tailored to city. Besides, government needs to pay more attention to the secondary uh, secondary industry. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Zi Yu, uh, for an interesting topic. Uh, now, um, this is the end of our, uh, no, this is the final speaker of our session. And before we go to the next uh, Q&A session, let's open everyone's camera so that we can take a special group picture in the COVID-19 time. Um, everyone, if you're convenient, please open your camera. Dr. Fong, is that okay on your side? Yes, I, I'm still waiting for everybody to open. Maybe um, then I can do the screen screenshot. Um, I just keep doing. And you may give a one, two, three count so everybody has, can have the best expression. <laughs> sure. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yes, I think we're good now. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, so now it's our QA session. I do have a question for Dr. Rosado. Um, 
you talked about the barriers to implement uh, digital twins for uh, the material flow. Uh, actually, in our research group at Tongzi, we are doing research on creating digital twins for construction sites and buildings in operation. But it's the first time that we are uh, learning from like creating digital twins for materials flows. So what are the essential steps or technologies do you think are really important for creating digital twins for the stocks of building materials? Um, thank you for your question, uh, Pei Shen, right? Did I yeah. say your name correctly? Right. Okay. <laughs> um, well, um, I'm in a way, so, so the digital twin project is, is actually a, a large um, project in Sweden, which is called Digital Twin City Center. Uh, and the idea is that a large group of people is involved in, in developing this project uh, in a lot of different dimensions. I'm actually, I actually don't know all the details about how to put it in place. Um, I know that some people are, have I, been working on a 3D model for Sweden uh, using un the Unreal Engine. Um, and then there's a lot of different people working on a lot of different topics. Uh, for example, um, wind, wind predictions based on, on morphology of, of, the, of, the, of the territory, for example. Uh, flows of people uh, in, in, in cities. Uh, there's a, another project ongoing where they, they track or they try to track construction sites uh, in real time uh, using a lot of different sensors and uh, even um, uh, drones and, and uh, small robots. So, so this is the kind of things that have starting to be done. Um, when it comes to the work that I'm doing, I'm really trying for now is really to try to understand what exactly do we need on one side, what type of information should be collected. And then on the other side, we need to look into what can we actually offer? Because I think um, a lot of these building stock modeling uh, information is 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 talking a lot about potentials, and I've been working with potentials for a lot of my work in the urban metabolism field. So so estimating how much could we do, how much is the potential out there, but um, but in this case the idea is that yes there is potential, but then you know there's a lot of other problems out there. Uh, I had a couple of students trying to do the doors inventory and it takes a lot of time to collect all the information for the doors, uh, just the doors on, of a building that uh, was going to be uh, refurbished. Uh, and we don't have this information. We don't have this information for all the buildings in a city, for example. So how can we actually do this uh, in, in a good way? Um, although the potential is there, um, it might not be possible. Uh, and then, you know, it, it's because it was coated with a paint for fireproof that is not the correct one anymore. So you need to take it. Um, then uh, the way you can dismantle it is not uh, possible. So you have to destroy it or destroy parts of it. Um, then it's not the right size or it's not the right uh, uh, or there is not enough doors to to put in the new in the next building, uh, and so on. So so just by looking into this very simple thing is 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 a very complicated task. So so um, yeah. So I think from my perspective, the point is really to try to see what can we actually provide now, um, and then trying to fill in the gaps as we go along. Thank you so <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Resedo. I know it's a really difficult thing to do, like to create digital twins. So everyone actually is learning how to do it right now. Um, thank you again for sharing. And I have a question for Charles and Will. Um, Regenerate is very interesting voluntary assessment tool. Um, 
but who will use it? Like, is it um, building designer, like design firms or building owners? And how do you think can promote the use of it? And another question is, I, I think I heard that you are saying this tool is in line with um, London plan. So among the 86 criteria, Am I remember right? Yeah, 86 criteria. How many of them are um, specifically, specifically applicable to London context or UK context? And how many of them do you think are general to any place in the world? Yep, so, so on the second question first, um, whilst I can remember it, um, all, all the criteria um, are um, completely general. They're, they're not specific, definitely not to London, um, definitely not to the UK. They're, they're all kind of high level um, design decisions that would help to make the building be more circular, even in its current form, or you know, making it more deconstructible, more adaptable, further down the line. So yeah, it's it's although it's in line with that, um, it, it's not restricted to that in any way. And that was something we were really keen on uh, ensuring um, that it, it it could be geared towards that, but it's encouraged for use on projects um, outside of London uh, and outside of the UK. Um, and then, what was the first question again? Sorry. Um, yeah, so what is the user of your tool and how do you promote the use of it? Yep. So because you can kind of use the tool um, at different product stages, so it's in, in line with the Reba product stages, which we obviously use uh, in the UK, the user is not, not restricted. So it could be the building owner. If they own the building, you know, it's already constructed, they could analyze their existing building. Um, although you could look at a proposed development at the very early design stages. Um, either the client themselves or an architect or the structural engineer um, could look at that. Um, but also by disaggregating the criteria um, by building layer, we've enabled each consultant team to kind of look at their area. So maybe you'd have the m &E engineer be responsible for the criteria that relate to um, the services, whereas the structural engineer would look at the criteria relevant to the structure. So it's, it's really putting the responsibility into all different stakeholders rather than saying, okay, you know, one person's responsible for everything. So it's sharing that responsibility across different members of the design team. Okay, great. Thank you for your answer. No. Um, and next I have a question for Zi Yu. Um, so you mentioned there may be an economic decline after implementing CE uh, policy. So what are the major factors or reasons behind this economic decline after implementing circular economy? Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned before, I think uh, the central government should pro provide more financial to the cities that uh, uh, have just begun to implement the state policy. And, uh, and as I do, the, uh, as a re result of hydrogen heterogeneity analysis show uh, that uh, there are uh, there are a huge decline in the uh, in the sec in the secondary industry. So, uh, if a government should pay more attention to secondary industry to avoid unnecessary panic, and uh, to help local government to make a, a successful transformation. Yeah, thank you. That's our like wonderful suggestions for the government. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Hi, I actually I have two questions. Uh, my first one is for Leon Leonardo Rosado. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I think you did a really brilliant job at highlighting a lot of the challenges we're facing. And I was wondering, how do you expect the tools to look like besides the digital twin? So I feel like there's only so much a digital twin could do, and especially addressing some of the more um, lawmaking challenges and stakeholder challenges. Would you actually see it, um, one of the tools being something like Regenerate? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think, again, um, in, a, in a sense, what we are looking here at is the information we need to be to have available uh, and what stakeholder would need what and what level of detail each of 
these stakeholders needs it. Um, so, so yes, it goes way beyond um, a digital twin for sure. Uh, I would I would say that um, there is, in a way, I I would like to think that we can have a unified approach, but that's probably not possible um, because it, it's just the way it is. Uh, it could be, uh, we, we, we have been discussing this um, the other day, been listening to some, some work from uh, Esri. Um, they want to do a digital twin of the world. Um, so so the, of the earth. <laughs> uh, and uh, and they, they, the way they want to do it is piece by piece. Um, and, and maybe what you need to look into is how these systems need to integrate between each other. And, and, and I find that a reasonable approach. So I think as long as things can communicate between each other, yes, it can be regenerated, it can be building stock models, it can be a lot of different tools and methods out there we need to work on the integration of these things. Great, right, thank you so much. And I also had a question for uh, Charles and Will. Why did you choose the layers, uh, like the shearing layers of change? So especially concerning services and skin, uh, sometimes in passive design, those are quite combined. Uh, will that not be something you're looking into, especially if you're looking into more um, innovative adaptability strategies. Um, yeah. Yes, I think that that mainly came from the different uh, lifespans of the different layers. So obviously, after about 15 to 20 years, you'll change your building services, but the structure still stays the same. Um, so it's about extending the building lifetime, considering that you'd have to upgrade and maintain different parts of the building. Um, and then like Charles said, having the layering also allows you to integrate the different design teams and sort of spread that uh, responsibility across stakeholders. But yeah, it's mainly about capturing the building, the, the different lifespans of, of the different layers. Yeah, and on that as well, I just said, it's not, if, the, if a criteria appears in one layer, it's not that it can't appear in the other layer. So the issue that you spoke about with um, services or uh, skin, if there was a criteria that applied to both, it would, it would appear in both those layers. Um, so that it hopefully wouldn't be so much of an issue in that case. Yeah, great, thank you so much for your input. Um, can I have a follow up, follow up question for Charles? Um, regarding your web version, I think it's really nice and really functional uh, tools. I think as we all talk about, you have 86 uh, criteria, and also you have, uh, at the end, you have a circularity percentage, which is really nice. It shows the building how, how many percentage of uh, your building it is in terms of circularity. And my question is, how did you provide the weight on each criteria to get out, to come out with these numbers? Good question. The simple answer is that there is no weight at present between the different criteria. Um, we, we, we took consideration from stakeholder workshops that were held, we took consideration of which criteria stakeholders believe to be most important, but this wasn't integrated as a weighting as such. That's something that as we collect data within the tool, we can see um, which criteria people are and aren't meeting, um, and that is to be used as weighting in, you know, in future iterations of the tool. So if there's a criteria that people are, are meeting on 90% of projects, we will reduce the weighting of this such that we're not rewarding them for what is standard practice. But at present, there's no weighting. So each, each criteria has one credit associated with it. So all that percentage represents is the percentage of those criteria that you've met. Yeah, there's no weighting. All right, uh, thank you. And uh, I, I think the time is coming to the end and we have other section coming on. Thank you very much for everybody's attendance and, uh, and really excellent presentations. I learned a lot as well. And also, in the following uh, program, which we have a lot of other programs, please uh, go attend them as well. I also shared a, a link around the wall. In there, they have a, a platform for everybody to chat. You can you can log in and take a look. 
Uh, you can talk to other clients, uh, other uh, colleagues as well. And uh, thank you very much. And I think that's it for the, at the end for this section. Uh, Dr. Fung, somebody um, is asking, can we share the recording of this session? Yes, I already recorded. And uh, I, was think, I will ask the committee how we're going to organize the, the recordings. I think there will be a way. Otherwise, you can send, uh, send the emails to us to share as well. OK. OK. OK, thank you, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, meeting you all and hope we can work together to uh, make a better and a sustainable world. Thank you so much. Okay, see you guys later in other sections. Bye. Bye.